This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to the Hindu's In Focus podcast with me Amit Barua your host for this episode. The Lok Sabha elections of 2024 are around the corner. The season of defections is also upon us. Party hopping has commenced in earnest. An India Today poll suggested earlier in February that the NDA or the National Democratic Alliance would win 335 seats in 2024 down from 353 in 2019. The Congress tally or the India tally was put at 71. A YouGov Mint CPR survey also published in February said that 51% believed that construction of the Ram Mandir on the site where the babri masjid once stood was a rectification of historical wrongs while 49% felt that it was an electorally motivated move to win hindu votes so with just about 2 months to go for lok sabha 2024 how does a political chessboard look like in india to discuss this issue i am joined by jeel wanier senior fellow at the center for policy research and visiting fellow at amherst college in the united states welcome to the in focus podcast jeel thank you for having me jeel my first question how do you assess the bjp's fortunes as we are on the cusp of uh, lok sabha 2024 well obviously they've been running on a high for um quite some time now from uh in victories in in recent state elections in 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 madhya pradesh in in rajasthan and and other states and and obviously uh the, the the boost of energy that they got from uh the inauguration of the ram temple in ayodhya the balance of probability seems to be tilting uh in their um favor um it's worth noting also that um the opposition seems bent on um helping or pushing you know the bjp on that um current you know upward wave by uh you know failing to um consolidate itself and 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 present a cohesive or coherent challenge to uh the bjp's dominance so at the moment yes uh things seems to be uh going in the direction of that the bjp wants and how do you look at the india alliance i mean we didn't have this india alliance in 2019 uh what is your sense of how it's faring so far well it's, it's kind of hard to assess because the alliance has not offered uh, a lot of you know content or or information on uh how it's planning to um go against uh, the bjp in in the incoming election I'm I'm really struck by the fact that uh, over the past you know few months uh, members of the alliance have been essentially busy you know speaking to themselves while uh, the BJP the government the prime minister have been essentially you know speaking to uh, the public um, at large and what we've seen uh, in uh, recent weeks and months is rather an unraveling of uh, that uh, alliance rather than you know any kind of uh, momentum they've lost uh, key uh, constituents they've lost key members uh, some prominent uh, regional leaders such as mamta banerji have you know publicly expressed a, a, a lack of faith uh, in the uh, alliance um the congress party seem unable to uh, construct or gather an alliance you know co- um, coherent around itself and beyond i mean from the very beginning you know uh, um commentators observers have been saying that uh, me conceiving an alliance an opposition alliance merely as a question of you know um an electoral arithmetic seat sharing agreements would be utterly insufficient there has to be a narrative there has to be a, a proposition made to uh, voters and the simple fact is that uh, there's still no trace of uh, that proposition yet and jeel what is your sense i mean you follow up politics of course uh, very closely and we know the obvious strengths of the bjp in north india so in lok sabha 2024 what are the critical states to watch out for in your view see 
the BJP has a rather thin majority in, in the Lok Sabha. We tend to forget that. It's around 55, 56% of uh, the seats, uh, I think, on its own, uh, which means that, uh, and, and we know that the, their majority is, is based on their ability to uh, sweep uh, the North, right? They are currently holding uh, somewhere around, you know, 80% of the seats uh, in, 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 in the Hindi belt. And so the challenge for the BJP is to maintain itself at that high degree of, of, of dominance. And so my sense is that it's not so much that, you know, key states are, you know, some, some states are particularly key, but it's the overall ability of the BJP to retain uh, a similar uh, degree of dominance across states. Uh, there is a perfectly plausible scenarios where the BJP wins all the states of North India, but not exactly at the same rate. Uh, and they could actually lose their majority even by winning every state in Northern India, should the opposition, the Congress, other parties in other states, you know, sort of grapple, uh, you know, a few state, a few seats, five, six, seven, eight, you know, seats, you know, across different states. And so um, this is a national election. Uh, it's 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 a national it's a national stage. Every seat is going to matter for the BJP. And and what's your sense? I, I know what you said about North India, uh, you know, as a as a whole, as a overall for the BJP being critical. But what would you say about Bihar, which is a critical state, which sends uh, forty members to the Lok Sabha, and we've seen all uh, the political acro acrobatics possible from Nitish Kumar. I mean, what uh, will that vote share of Nitish Kumar finally take the BJP? Uh, you know. Uh, pass the post in a sense uh, in Bihar. Well, it's it's very much possible. I mean, as you've just mentioned, it's not the first time. It's not the first dance, you know, of of Nitish Kumar uh, in in Bihar. And voters so far don't seem, you know, particularly bothered by it. Uh, he doesn't seem to particularly suffer electorally, electorally from from you know his you know let's call them, you know, changes of heart. Um, so there's no reason that, I don't see any reason that uh, that, you know, should not be the case uh, in, in, in the coming election. If anything, it could help the BJP to, you know, compensate for the predictable loss of a few seats in other, you know, Hindi belt um, states. But that being said, I'm not sure that it's going to make, you know, such a huge difference. And I want to uh, draw your attention to one more state, which is Maharashtra, you know, and we are seeing a lot of political pyrotechnics in, uh, you know, Maharashtra as well, with Ashok Chavan jumping ship to the BJP. Uh, it still appears that the BJP is somewhat worried uh, about Maharashtra because it is a big state. And last time it sent, uh, you know, big majority, gave a big majority to the BJP. What is your sense this time on, uh, you know, how Maharashtra will fare or do? Well, Maharashtra is a very, com very complicated uh, state to, to, to handle. Um, what I would say is that uh, what we've seen in India over the past few uh, years is, you know, a, a decoupling of electoral behavior between state and, and national elections. And we've always known that state elections results are very poor predictors of things to come. Uh, but we know now with a fairer degree of you know, certainty that uh, voters are perfectly fine, you know, voting differently in different kinds of um, elections. And so uh, we know also that national factors tend to predominate. We know that the Modi factor tends to play uh, stronger in, in a national um, election. The question, of course, is whether it is going to be enough to compensate for, you know, the sort of chaos that has been, you know, characteristic of Maharashtra politics in, in, in recent months. But all in all, uh, the, the, the national angle should, should prevail over um, these regional and sometimes even, you know, sub-regional uh, subtleties. I just want to pick up on that point you made about voters, uh, you know, behaving differently in assembly elections and in Lok Sabha elections. Uh, we've, we've seen quite a history, about, uh, you know, for it. So what is your sense? I mean, are we moving towards a more presidential system? Because it would appear that voters think, or at least North India voter, North Indian voters think that you know the country is safe in Mr. Modi's hands. 
I think it's been two general elections already that you know national elections have uh, had more of a, a, a plebiscitary character. Uh, I mean, we can call it presidential, we can call it plebiscitary um, also. That seems quite clear. And as long as Mr. Modi is there at the helm, this is a feature that is going to um, continue. But we also get blinded by, you know, this, you know, perception of, you know, dominance of the BJP at, at the national level. If you look at election results in, in, in greater detail at the constituency level, if you look at whatever information we have actually on, on electoral behavior, we see that Indian voters uh, and electoral behavior remains uh, characterized by more volatility uh, than um, than we sometimes uh, expect. We have this vision of, you know, solidly ideologically anchored um, voters supporting, you know, the BJP. But in fact, even between elections, you know, a lot of voters basically shift uh, party and shift, shift, shift their vote. And so that remains um an element of answer that that creates an element of uncertainty to um, Indian elections that has not disappeared, even though in the aggregate uh, the BJP does um, occupy a, a dominant position. Uh, Gilles, I want to also ask you about uh, you know the the main themes that uh, you know might dominate the elections. One is obviously uh, the construction of the Ram Mandir and, uh, you know, what the BJP hopes to uh, cash in from that, especially in, uh, you know, the state which you watch uh, very carefully, which is Uttar Pradesh. What is your sense of, you know, how this factor might help the BJP? It's very, Honestly, it's very hard to, it's very hard to tell, right? I think the strength of the BJP is to mobilize on uh, a, a multiplicity of themes rather than, you know, on a single theme. Uh, obviously, we can say, you know, I mean, nationalism is important. Hindutva, of course, is core to their um, ideology and to their proposal, but they offer also, you know, a great other many things, right? If you remember the 2019 campaign, Overall, this was a campaign led around the theme of uh, protection, protection of the poor, protection of the nation, protector of the territory, with, of course, you know, Mr. Modi as the central figure, uh, the center, central protective figure, you know, at, at the center, at the center of um, everything. But voters have, in a way, a luxury of choice. They can pick what they like and and and, and decide to support uh, or not support the BJP accordingly. And so it's very hard to isolate any particular factor and, and, and particularly predict how uh, voters are going to um, respond uh, about it. What we know from the recent survey, the YouGov survey uh, run by my colleague Rahul Verma at CPR and his colleagues uh, recently that you mentioned, is that uh, the construction of the temple, the inauguration of the temple, the fact that this was a, a, a head of a government taking the lead of for really essentially a religious event and has become quite normalized, right? And that's obviously indicative of um, a fairly massive shift in you know in, in voters' um, views, attitudes, preferences. Uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, the inauguration of the temple would have uh, had the same degree of acceptability 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and certainly not 30 years ago when the Babri Masjid was destroyed, right? And so, yes, we can assume that it's going to play in favor of, of, of the BJP, but not necessarily as, you know, a short-term response to a particular signal or event but more as uh, the product of uh, a more sort of grounded, more ground level, you know, uh, social transformation that's taking place. And and what is your sense of Uttar Pradesh, you know, the state which you have watched closely over many years? And uh, we don't have a real alliance. I mean, the Congress is quite a bit player and the RLD is going on its own with the BJP now. So what is your sense of, uh, you know, how, because UP does send uh, 80 members to the Lok Sabha, and that's a huge, uh, you know, huge number. See, the, the rules of the game have changed in UP because this used to be, you know, the competitive state, the fragmented state. No party ever, I mean, since before 2022, uh, no party ever succeeded in, you know, win, winning a re-election, right? So it was permanent volatility, permanent turnover of governments, uh, parties in power and, and so forth. 
And a lot of that uncertainty, a lot of that um, volatility came from the fact that the, the party system was fragmented between, you know, three, four major players, uh, SP, BSP, Congress, um, Congress, BJP. Now the political landscape has uh, drastically changed. Uh, there are essentially two main parties uh, in UP. Uh, the BSP has, uh, uh, for all practical purpose, collapsed. The Congress has virtually uh, disappeared. They, they, they scored 2.5% in the last you know, state election. So they, they virtually became, you know, they they've virtually politically disappeared from UP. And so UP has become bipolar. And the result of that is that it actually raises the bar for winning seats, right? When you have a fragmented landscape, the average winning victory, you know, if you score 30, 35% of the vote, that's usually sufficient to uh, win a seat. But now in order to win a seat, you need 45% and actually closer, closer almost, you know, to 50 on average. Uh, which is a very different uh, proposition. You do not campaign, you do not strategize, you do not mobilize, you know, the same way when you target specific segments of the electorate or when you target the electorate uh, at large. And this is also where the BJP has a number of advantages uh, because of its ability to reach out to a, a large number of segments of uh, voters by offering them nationalism, by offering them welfare, by offering them strong leadership, and, and so forth. And so that poses a challenge, right? Uh, the BJP won uh, the last state election in, in, in UP quite decisively, uh, and the SP did you know, the best performance, its best historical performance in the state, but that was insufficient to uh, actually pose a challenge, a serious challenge to um, the BJP. And the problem for the SP now that neither the BSP, which is not an, a coalition or an alliance player in the first place, nor uh, the Congress, which has virtually nothing to offer to the SP in UP, can uh, come in, in, in support to the uh, SP uh, against the BJP in UP. Uh, Gilles, I wanted to ask you about the a a BSP. I mean, it looks almost as if Mayavati feels she can't come to power or she's lost interest. She, she's interested in contesting elections, yes. But it's almost as if she's not interested in becoming uh, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh again. I've written about this and I, I, I really believe that the, the BSP remains stuck with the uh, model of doing politics that used to help it win elections in the past, in which is a formula that is no longer um, functioning. Uh, that uh, formula, in, in a nutshell, uh, consisted in mobilizing the Dalit base of the party and combining, you know, whatever vote share that would bring across constituencies with what a, with you know a supplement of votes coming from candidate handpicked from locally dominant groups. Right. So if you have, you know, 20 percent from, you know, that it vote plus, you know, 10, 15 percent from brought by, you know, a strong uh, or a strong man candidate, uh, that would be a combination sufficient to win an election. But that's a model that functioned, that worked when the political landscape was fragmented and when you could actually win seats with 30 percent of the votes, if not less. But that's utterly ineffective when the rules of the game have changed and you have to raise the bar um, considerably. And the BSP has lost its ability to reach out to um, other group. In some ways, you know, the uh, the news of the BSP's death is is exaggerated because, you know, um, the, the, the following of uh, Mayawati among Dalit, particularly among Jatav Dalit, remains um, actually quite uh, strong on the ground, but it's it's a core base of supporter which is now uh, which has eroded and which is more and more isolated and which no longer has the ability because the party has lost the ability of building these local alliances that helped the BSP won uh, elections before. Basically, you no longer can win elections by targeting specific segments of the population. You have to you, know, you have to target a very large array. But for that, you need resources, you need um, organization, but you also need a narrative. You also need to have, you know, content to offer. And that uh, that has been uh, rather missing uh, with the B with the BSP in, in, in recent times. 
Uh, Jeel, I'd like to take you southwards now. You know, we, we've discussed North India. And obviously, Karnataka is a state where the BJP did very well in 2019. Uh, what is your sense overall looking at the South, how they might do in, in the South, the BJP that is? I mean, if you take the South at large, we know that the BJP has yet to, you know, find a formula to, you know, establish itself. Karnataka is, is, is a separate case. The reason, of course, are historical. The reason are sociological. Also, the BJP remains perceived as basically a, a North Indian proposition. But um, the fact is also specific regional conditions uh, pose particular challenge uh, to uh, the BJP, perhaps more so than other parts of the country. Across the South, you have states led by um, regionalist parties uh, that um, incarnate or, or claim to defend uh, a regional identity versus the, the, the national narrative and national identity proposal offered by the BJP, which they depict as basically being essentially, you know, Hindi speaking and North Indian and, 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 and so forth. And therefore, these are parties that have uh, of course, uh, a long historical presence, organization, resources embedded in, you know, power networks, you know, uh, across their states. But more importantly, they have uh, a political narrative that they can um, offer, that they offer to their uh, to their voters, right? I remember the last election in Tamil Nadu, um, the DMK presented, you know, they spoke about the elections as, you know, uh, or the rise of the BJP as an existential threat to uh Tamil identity, right? And so um, these are parties that have the ability to uh, bring a counter narrative to whatever you know the BJP is proposing, and 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 which is why the BJP has faced you know uh, so many difficult uh, has had so many difficulties in in doing so. Even in the last elections in Karnataka, the Congress has actually succeeded in sort of building on an organization that had, you know, a pan-state um, appeal and that also pitted, you know, the regional versus uh, the national uh, other. And uh, so that that perhaps, you know, explain how, you know, the South as, as of now still, you know, eludes to the BJP. Before I let you go, uh, Gilles, I wanted to ask you about the Supreme Court judgment uh, on the conduct of elections. Will this have any impact on Lok Sabha 2024? I doubt that very much. Well, first of all, we we should welcome um, the, the the judgment. Many you know scholars and activists and 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 have been you know decrying the uh, you know inherently you know opaque and, and problematic character of the electoral bond, and and the uh, Supreme Court has clearly taken the right decision. But that's a decision that's coming at least five six years too late. Uh, one wonders you know why it took so long. To the Supreme Court to 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 come to the realization that you know this was an unconstitutional um, instrument, and in many ways you know the damage has already been done, right? In a way, you know the electoral bonds have already served their purpose. The bulk of uh, fundraising for the incoming election is already done. This is not money that is going to be you know refunded, um, and so uh, the BJP over the past you know six years or so has drawn undue advantage uh, from from this mechanism. And even though it still remains you know a fraction of the uh, amount of money that is you know spent you know in politics and in, in elections, uh, it has been a, a factor that has helped um, rather unduly the BJP in both state and in national elections. And so this is not a victory of the opposition. I don't really remember, and I mean, I mean, some members of the opposition have, you know, led the charge against, you know, uh, the, the the electoral bonds. But by and large, uh, opposition parties also relied on electoral bonds, you know, for funding, barring a few exceptions like the communists or the BSP. And so um, it's unlikely that this is going to have an effect on um, voters' behavior. This is not this is not a judgment that's going to create transparency. Right now, um, the system is struck down. We basically are going to go from, you know, the new opaque system back to the old opaque system, right? Which is not uh, an ideal, you know, situation either. Uh, the Supreme Court, if I'm correct, does not ask, you know, the government um, to create transparency within the system. It says, you know, the system has to go. 
And so the question is, well, something will have to come in its place. Either we go back to the, you know, previous uh, situation or, you know, some other mechanism uh, will be uh, put in place. But that's by definition is going to be, you know, for later. Gilles Vanya, uh, thank you so much for talking to the Hindus in Focus podcast. Your insights as an academic, as someone who's been watching Indian elections for a long time are welcome. Thank you again, and I look forward to speaking to you as the Lok Sabha election nears. Thanks for having me. In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by the Hindu. We'll see you soon.